Hello, this is Bill Webb, aka Billy Indiana. Today I'm going to do a brief spotlight board game review for Trekking Through History. This is by Charlie Bank and published by Underdog Games. I'm going to show you real briefly how you play and then give you my thoughts on what I think about Trekking Through History. Well, I never did a full unboxing of Trekking Through History, so I'm going to do kind of a brief one here as part of this spotlight overview, mainly just because I, I've always really appreciated the details and the quality of the creation that Underdog Games does. So in Trekking Through History, there's just so much little things to notice. I like the quote on the inside, history is not a burden on the memory, but an illumination of the soul by Lord Acton. And then got a little QR code there so you can see the how to play video. Um, and then we've got nice components. It's kind of a, uh, you know, almost like a card stock here of just a reference sheet that you don't necessarily need, but that can be helpful during the game. Got a nice rule book. It is a pretty simple game to learn. And so there's not a lot of details there. Um, and then a thick kind of timer board. And so it's that thick cardboard that is really nice. And then we've got the different player kind of boards. Um, I'll explain when we look at the card, but just the art quality is nice. And they have kind of a, almost like a linen finish to them. And then there's all this nice container inside that holds all the little elements, which we'll talk about on the uh, quick how to play. We won't do a full rules overview, but just everything has its place. Everything's nice and organized. The cards all, you know, fit right neatly into the, the sections. And so before I set it up, before I set the game up, I wanted to help you see, you know, just the quality of the design and the attention to detail that they've taken with Trekking Through History. So now I'll take a minute, I'll set it all up and show you uh, how to play. So here I have the game set up and I just wanna tell you what these different components represent and then quickly walk through a turn so you can get an idea for it. Um, there's the neoprene mat, which was rolled up into the box and the edge. I don't know if you could see it when I was showing it earlier, but um, so it's a really nice, you know, neoprene rolls out smoothly. It's got this scoring snake track on here. This isn't part of the board, this is a separate board. I just, I pulled it down here so we can see it and talk about it. You've got three decks of cards. So the first era, they all have a little one in the corner and I've got first era out and I've taken the top five cards here uh, and put them in these spaces. And then this is the rest of era one deck. And then we've got era two and era three decks that are in the box here. And you play this game in three rounds. So after the third era of cards played, then the game's over and the person with the most points wins. Now the clock tracks how time passes for each round. And so um, we've got for the red player and the green player, little nice plastic chunky pieces here that look like clocks, look like little pocket watches uh, that travel around this clock. And each player also gets a little crystal, crystal tank to store crystals, which help you um, basically not spend as much time to take actions as you travel around. Each player also gets a reference card. And so I've got one of those here. We'll just put this down here and discuss it. Each player is also going to take four of these itinerary cards. And every itinerary card has the same pattern across the top in terms of red, blue, yellow, and green. But they all have a different pattern. So you can see two different examples here. They'll have a different pattern down below. And as you put tokens onto this, you're going to be earning points. Anytime you see these little green circles, you're going to be earning time crystals, which go in your tank that I mentioned anytime you cover up one of those. So every player is going to have four, and they're going to choose one per round. So in the first round, let's say they chose this one. All right. Uh, or one player chose this one. And then another player is going to choose from there four the one they want to use on that round. All right. So the basic gameplay, if we follow the turn reference, it says... If you're the furthest behind on the clock, take a turn. So at the beginning of the game, you decide who's going to go first, and that person's token goes on top. Because if it's a tie for furthest back, the one on top goes first. So the way it's set up now, the pinkish red player would go first. On your turn, choose a card. So you're going to either choose one of these five, which gets you the bonus down below, as well as the bonuses on the card. And the bonuses are just these little tokens that you're gonna put on your itinerary and you fill the itinerary from top down. Or you can choose this one, you just don't get a bonus. And so usually you're not. You're gonna try not to choose that one. If you can't play them, and I'll explain in a minute why you might not be able to play them, you could choose one of these visit your ancestor cards. And so I'll explain kind of a turn and why you might wanna 
choose certain cards. The goal is as you choose these cards, you're going to, one, want to be filling in your itinerary, and so you're going to be thinking about what the bonuses are to try to fill these top down column by column to earn as many points as you can. But you're also going to be needing to put them in chronological order. So if I'm the red player and I go first, I look across here, it's 1385, 1891, 1826, or sorry, 1829, 1762, 1472 BCE and 41 BCE. So I would choose this one, create your own success with Hatshepsut. <laughs> I probably butchered that name. Uh, and then it's going to cost me two time. And so I would move my pocket watch two time unless I wanted to spend one of my crystals out of my chamber and each player starts with one. So I might choose one and that means it costs me one less hour. So that's how those crystals work. And I'm going to take one of these red um, items as my bonus for taking this card and it was here so I'm also going to get a green one based on where it was at so I would take a red one and a green one and then I'm going to place that in my time travel chart here and now I need to get one that's more recent in history than 1472 BCE and I'm going to place these in my positions here on the chart so I put that one at the top in the red I put this one at the top in the green and it didn't earn me any bonuses yet but I'm just going to keep filling them down so the next red one I get is going to earn me two points and the one after that two then three then three and if you connect if you can fill in a whole row here where they're connected side to side you can see this would earn me ten points if I get these three so the third blue one the second yellow one and the second green one once those are filled in would get me ten points and so that's basically the choosing a card moving your pocket watch collecting your benefits updating your itinerary and then you're going to place your card in the trick. So that's there. And that's that's a turn. Then you're going to slide and refill. So this slides down, this slides down, this slides down, and this slides down. And now it's the next player's turn. Now there are some uh, icons on here that have a W. Those are the wild tokens. So if you draw a purple wild token, you can put that in any of these colors, red, blue, yellow, or green. Otherwise, you have to go color by color. So And you can see the different colors here, blue, yellow, green, and red. Here's the crystals for time management. And then the wilds are purple. And that's basically the flow of the game. Anytime you do score something on your itinerary, you're going to actually track it here. So let's say it was my next turn now. The other players have all gone and it's my next turn. If these are the cards that are available, I would want to choose this one possibly because um, even though there's no extra bonus, it is 342, so it's pretty far back in time. And I would get these two. I would get a wild and a red. The red's going to score me two points and the wild I can put wherever I want. Or if I wanted to really adjust the time bonuses or the time management, I could choose this one. It's still 41 BCE. It does cost four time, but it gives me a red one and two crystals and then another crystal here. So that's a lot of bonuses. So I'd be kind of torn. Do I want further back in time with fewer bonuses, but it costs me less in time? Or do I want this one with a lot of bonuses and I could manage my time much better later um, and spend more time now? So let's say that I chose this one, 41 BCE. I take this card and it fits in my itinerary because it's more recent historically. I'm going to get the red token, which I would just put here and immediately score two points on the track. I'm going to get um, the two wild, or sorry, not wilds, uh, the two time crystals and put them in my tank. And because it was above a wild here, I get another one and put it in my tank. Now you can't use the wilds that you earned that turn to adjust your time. You have to follow the order. So choose your card, move your pocket watch. I really should have moved my pocket watch four first. So one, two, three, four. And again, I would only be able to do that if this person had gone and was ahead of me. So one, two, three, four. And I can't use any of the just earned crystals to reduce my time. But that's basically the flow of the game. And then we would refresh this, every other player goes. And so you're constantly getting a new set of cards that are showing. If you ever just don't see one you want, you can choose, the, like I said, the Visit Your Ancestors card. It does give you a wild token bonus and it costs three hours. But the, it says a question mark here. So if I put this in my sequence, uh, because the most recent card was 41 BCE, that means this one is the same, 41 BCE. And you could even put those ancestor cards multiple in a row if you wanted to. Now, as you're moving this around, you'll be leapfrogging and, and you know, moving and taking cards. If when you come around, you can land exactly at 12 o'clock, there's a little three here, meaning you get a three point punctuality bonus. If you, let's say you were here and you had a card you wanted to take, but it was three, like maybe I wanted this one, you know, it would go one, two, three, it goes beyond 12, but you just stop it at 12 and you wouldn't get the punctuality bonus. Once all the players have moved around and everyone has either landed on 12 or surpassed it and stopped at 12, the round is over. 
And so we would slide this off. We would um, take all these era one cards away. We would make sure we should be scoring our, our uh, itinerary card as we go. We'd make sure that that's all up to date. And then we get a new itinerary. We do get to keep our crystals. So any that we still have in our tank, we get to keep. And any of the timelines that we're actually currently working on, we get to keep. But we have to start a new itinerary. We take all the era one cards away. And then we take out the era two card deck and play with the era two card. Now this little summary sheet here tells us what all the dates are on the era one deck and all the dates in era two and all the dates in era three. So this is a reference that everyone can look at if they would like to try to get an idea of which cards are going to be coming up possibly and which ones they should be choosing. And so that's not every rule. There's a few other details that I've kind of glossed over. At the end of the round, the back is explained on the player reference, which is nice. So you discard the current era, like I said. You're going to discard your current itinerary, and then you're going to begin another day. In the end of the game, you should have been tracking on this snake any cards you've earned from your itinerary or otherwise. There are some. Uh, there's an expansion here where you could earn some points that way too. And then you're also going to earn at one point for any time crystal that you didn't spend. And then you're also going to earn points for your treks. And so you're, you're creating these treks. And if you ever get to the point where you can't put a card down that is more current historically, then you can say, okay, I'm just done with that trek. And you can close it and you can start with a new one at any date you choose. And, but ideally, you want to try to get farthest you, the farthest you can along in terms of the number of cards in your time story. Because if you only have one and you have to start a new one, you actually lose three points. If you only have two, it's worth zero. So you don't get a penalty, but you don't actually earn anything from it. But if you can get three in your time chain, then you're going to earn two victory points. And so you could close that up within the middle of a round, at the end of a round, whenever you choose. Uh, if you just don't like the cards that are out there, or you can't play one that's more recent, you can close it up and start a new one at any point in time. You can't start a new one with the Ancestor card, so you have to use one of the ones that are out here. So if you can keep growing that timeline and growing that timeline down here at 10 cards, if you can make a timeline that's 10 cards, that's 30 points. And then beyond 10, every additional card in the timeline adds three more. And so you're trying to kind of push for, okay, I want the cards closest together in date so I can get as many of them as I can possibly in my timeline to earn you know the majority of the points because it's 2, 4, 7, 10, 15, 18, 21, 30. You know, some, a big jump when you, when you get down there to that 10th one. But there's a limit. You know, these are the only cards that are in each era. So if you've already got the 1903 card down in era one, you can't keep going on that timeline. You have to start a new one. So, uh, so this is kind of handy to be able to refer to and see, you know, what cards are still available. So that's basic gameplay. Like I said, there is a little mini expansion. It says, warning, you're about to enter a time warp. Do not open until you've played the basic game at least once. If you use these time warp cards, they have just kind of little game-breaking deals. Uh, maybe not really game-breaking. That might be the right word for it. But game-changing rules where you could, for instance, on... Uh, let's see. Let's just look at a couple of them. This one says, for a cost of two hours, reveal the top three cards of the current deck, gain one of them, and put the other two at the bottom of the deck. And so these just... You choose three, one for each round, and then for the whole first round or which you know whichever round you're on, that card is going to be basically an option for you to choose. And so we use these little tokens to move up around a score on the snake, but every player actually does have a second token. And if you're using this expansion, then if you can only do that once per era. And so if you did, you'd put your token there to show, oh, I, I, I use that already. So the next turn, I'm, that's not an option anymore. You can only do it once per time. So that's the expansion. Um, and that's how you play the game. So what are my thoughts about trekking through history? Well, I've played quite a few of the underdog games. I've played trekking through the national parks and actually own it, trekking the world and own that, trekking through history now. I have her story, but haven't had a chance to play it yet. I just recently received it. And what I've noticed is trekking through the national parks was kind of a ticket to ride feeling game, very simple. Um, and it was fun. And, it, and the art of all the different national parks was beautiful. And it had information about each of the parks on the back. So educational and beautiful. Um, and that's kind of the thing that I'm noticing about underdog games is they have informational, educational, beautiful games, but with interesting mechanisms. And I feel like every iteration that I've played, I've seen improvements. So I like trekking with the national parks, but we don't play it that often. It's really a game if someone really loves hiking or going to national parks and they haven't played a lot of games, it's a good fit for that because they get to see the beautiful art. 
Uh, we played with a friend not too long ago, and he he's traveled to a bunch of the national parks, and so he just loved looking at the art, and you're moving around on a map, and and he liked that part of it. And it was a simple enough game that even though he hadn't played a lot of board games before, he was able to do that pretty easily. Then Trekking Through the World is a little bit more advanced in terms of the mechanics, but it has that same beautiful art, and it's got all these incredible places around the world that you can investigate and learn about when you read the information on the back. And now this one, Trekking Through History, you know, you can read about these events on the back of the card, and so it's educational. The art is beautiful. The component quality is great. And so that's one thing I'm really impressed with, not just this game, but really underdog games in general. The quality of the games and the combination of good gameplay with some educational information and then just great component quality and art. So specifically trekking through history, what I really like about this one is there are some pretty tough decisions and yet it's really an easy game to teach. You know, basically take a card, try to put them in order. It costs you a certain amount of time. You're gonna get some benefits and you're filling in this little map over here with those benefits, trying to fill them up in a particular order where you gain the most points. And so it's pretty easy to learn the game you can teach it to just about anybody, and, and I think people are going, oh, yeah, that's that's cool, especially if they're into history. Oh, yeah, I've, I've read about that, or I heard about that, or I learned about that in school, or, you know, so I, I feel like there's a connection to just about anyone. We've all taken history classes before, and they may not know the information, and some people are going to be more or less interested in that, but um, I feel like it's easy to, to teach, and, and yet it's got a nice game flow, and you have to think about, okay, well, I want this card, but that's going to mean I have to stop my timeline because I'm not going to be able to get anything more recent than that. Am I ready to stop my timeline? Or do I want to extend it by taking one of these Ancestor cards, even though it costs me three hours and only gets me a while? And then I might, do I want to use a time crystal now? Oh, maybe if I use it at the end, I can use it to make sure I hit that punctuality bonus and get a three extra points when I get around to 12 o'clock again. Oh, but what of these do I need? If I take... This one right here, it's got yellow and red, but my yellow and red columns are already filled out on my itinerary, so I don't want that one, but I do want the date. So there's just all these little decisions you're trying to think through and manage. And so it's it's enough to think about to keep you really mentally engaged and, and feels like a, a good solid board game. And yet it's really easy to understand and play. And so I would rate this one a seven, maybe even a seven and a half in terms of if I'm just thinking gameplay seven, because it is pretty simple. And so I wouldn't necessarily for my wife and I just want to pull this out over and over again, but I would quickly pull it out if there was someone that was a little newer to board games or someone that was just really into history or even just someone who's never played this game before because there's enough there. I think any gamer can really enjoy it. Um, but the quality of the components kind of leans me towards seven and a half. So I'm, I'm kind of right in that seven, seven and a half range for this game. And every time I've played it, I've enjoyed it. And everyone I've played it with has enjoyed it. And they've also the same thing. Oh, it's just so easy, but there's a lot to think about. And uh, it's just so beautiful. So Trekking Through History is a game that I highly recommend um, and one that I think just about anybody can play. And if you want to use it with younger children and use it as an educational resource, you can. If you just want to use it as you know a resource management and little puzzle game to think through, that's fine too. You don't have to read what's on the back of the cards, but I find it really interesting to learn about these things in history, these times and, and uh, people and uh, developments throughout history. So hopefully you've enjoyed learning a little bit about trekking through history, how you play the game, and my thoughts, reflections on what I like about this game. If you did, I'd love it if you give it a thumbs up down below, and it would be terrific if you would leave some comments. Tell me what you think about this game if you've played it. Let me know what questions you have, if there's something about the rules that didn't come cl clear in my explanation. Or, you know, if you've played some of the other trekking games or other underdog games, let me know what you think about those in the comments as well. As always, thanks for watching. This is Billy Indiana, signing off. Huh.